Okay, so what's the integration picture that results? A human race that is hostile, crazy, addicted to violence. Considering it entertainment is a real big telling point. Addicted to incompetence because we're so bad at everything. I mean, it's really embarrassing when you can't count to three. All right. Addicted to saying that whatever is the truth, we prefer a lie. And so we'd rather watch and spend money on vampire and mummy movies than spend money on learning anything in life. I mean, look at the teachers. They're not paid well. And I'm not trying to malign basketball players or anything, but they get paid a lot more money than teachers. And yet, without teachers, where are you? We don't value learning. We value money. But we sure don't value learning or we'd pay money to get it. Now, ancient civilizations were not as dumb as we are. So you can't say that we've advanced. In the old days, Greeks and Romans, and they loved violence more than we do. Well, maybe they don't love it more than we do. They practiced it more and we might be just too tired. They paid really big sums of money for certain activities we pay a pittance for today. If you were in the military, you got paid a pittance unless you got to sack a city and then you got as much as you wanted. Of course, the top brass took their share of it first. You ended up getting cheated anyhow, but you got to be a citizen of the Roman Empire at the end of your 20 years of service. If you were the first to break through a wall or had some other, you know, dangerous thing that you did during a military campaign, you got exempted from taxes for life and some really big benefits. If you were a particularly renowned teacher, you got paid big also. If you were really good at writing a play that was peculiarly erudite, you got a lot of money also. Of course, if you were just the teacher of the children in the household, you got almost nothing and you got beaten a lot. You were treated like a slave. So that wasn't so great about Roman culture. In Greek culture, sometimes it was much better, but not always. Ancient Chinese culture, the, the, the scholars, were paid a lot, but then Chinese developed as a language in order to make it hard to read. The whole, the whole structure of Chinese is deliberately hard to read, so that only the scholars know it. That keeps the peasant in, the, in his place. Same thing could be said for Hebrew. At least, mid, middle, middle, what do you want to call it? Medieval Hebrew. The alphabet we have to use today. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Same can be said for a lot of languages. A lot of languages, the writing, the written form of the language was deliberately designed to be hard to learn. To keep the elites in power. What does that tell you? But they got paid well. And you got paid well if you learned it. Today, our alphabets are very easy to read. Language is very easy to learn, but nobody cares to learn it. And nobody cares to pay the teachers either. Now, the human race, therefore, pays a lot of lip service to morality and virtuous ideas. But that's just a facade, a veneer. The minute you have a little lapse in law and order, then man's bestial nature takes over. We saw real widespread evidence of that very recently during Hurricane Katrina. Here was Louisiana underwater, New Orleans specifically, and that because nobody was paying the, the workers right to do the shoring up right. 
So when the water came, bam. And what are the people doing during the hurricane? Are they trying to help each other get out? No, they're looting the stores, stealing waterlogged televisions. Not, you know, I mean, the, the, hello, if it's waterlogged, it's not going to be able to play. They're stealing things from the stores. And then you saw it live on TV, all the looting. So much for the vaunted, my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. Nobody cares about his family. They cared about looting. So much for modern society and our refinements. It's not just here that it happened. It happens everywhere. Whenever you have a small breakdown in law and order, people think, oh good, well the police can't catch us now. And people take that opportunity to take vengeance on others or to steal or to rape, pillage, whatever they can do. That's what they did in the old days too. And human race has not improved since. So what you're looking at here as an integration of the world, of the human of the world, is a veneer of, oh, I'm a good person. And lip service to morality, but honey, when a little bit of difficulty occurs, that morality is just, that's just window dressing. So you can pride yourself at a party, at a cocktail party. It means nothing. People are notoriously fickle. And notoriously disloyal. I got my first taste of that when I was very young. And a, a rich relative of mine died. And everybody fought over her money. I, I think I was like 10 at the time. Maybe 9. And I thought to myself, is this what being in a family is for? Everybody fighting over her money? She was barely 12 hours dead. And who gets what? And I'm like, okay. I don't want to be part of a family. I missed her. Who gives a flip about the money? That's what people care about. That's what drives them. That's their God. It's either money or violence or sex or drugs or anything but the real God. And when the real God comes along and says a few things that are actually of benefit to you if you listened. I just believe my son paid for your sins and you'll be forever saved. That's pretty good news. That's pretty nice. And you don't have to work for it. It's free. But you're going to say no to that because, oh, you want to you wanna deserve to be saved yourself. And yet, when a little bit of law and order goes down, you have Watts riots or people fighting over the money of dead relatives. Human race sucks. I have absolutely no faith in it whatsoever. Now you see why. But it's not really about me. It's about them. And what they say is, oh, on the surface, oh, we're really nice and we're going to observe the behaviors and we're going to wear our hats to church and we're going to bob in front of the wailing wall and we're going to do all these little accepted things so that you're going to think well of me and I'm going to think well of you. And boy, at the first sign of trouble, that veneer just comes right off. Have you ever been around anybody who's been accused? Just accused. No proof given, they're just accused. Well, wow, boy, everybody deserts them. All you have to do is be accused. So much for family loyalty. So much for vaunted morality. So much for the quest for truth. So much for innocent until proven guilty. All you gotta do is be accused. Now these same hypocrites are the ones who are busy telling everybody and their brother that the Bible is a bunk. And I'm gonna listen to them? 
These same ones are the ones busy telling themselves that if they go and steal that waterlogged television, that that's going to make them happy. And they're sane people? That's a sane thought? If I get this job, if I get this house, if I get this car, if I get this, if I bring down this person, if I beat up this person, if I shoot this other person, happiness is a warm gun, that's all sane thinking? So you see, the salvation that God offers is really pretty big. And our wanted morality that we use as a weapon that we say, well, see, I'm a good person. I gave $5 in the collection plate, so God should save me. And we accord that kind of argument, any kind of positive status at all. You see why the world really needs to be drowned. And periodically it is. It gets so wrapped up in itself and so full of itself. And I'm sorry, but is your brain working when you look at some old ruins in Rome or India or East Asia or China and you say, oh, those terracotta soldiers. Oh, China was a great nation. What, because it had big buildings? Big buildings makes a nation great? Huge architecture makes a country great? A big house makes a big person? And you're going to call yourself moral and rational and sane. How about insane? Because that's what you have to be. We drool over the pyramids. Oh, Egypt was a great civilization. Really? Do you know that, that every Egyptian longed for death? They lived for death. Their whole, their whole so-called civilization was built around death. And they were so idiotic about it that they, they took their innards and they put them in canopic jars, really expensive jars, if you were noble. You took your guts out, stuck them in the jars, and your hollowed out body you put in the sarcophagus and you stuck that in a boat in the really old Egyptian culture and you put the boat in the ground and that was what you took with you to your afterlife if there is an afterlife why would your guts have to be outside your body they wrapped you in a mummy so that your skin wouldn't decay so much. Okay, but hello, putting your guts in a canopic jar is going to make them decay real fast. Why preserve your body from decay, but your guts are going in the jar? And you put all that inside a sarcophagus and that with some jewels and some little food offerings and all kinds of little junk and you stick it in a boat and you stick all that in the ground. In a pyramid, if you're rich enough. And that somehow magically is going to be alive in the next life? when we can still see the remains and the mummy and the canopic jars in this life? So how can it be in two places at once? So if we can see it here, then it's not there. If it's not there, then either there's no afterlife or the afterlife doesn't need what's here. So why are you going to the trouble to mummify the body and take the canopic jars out? And the Egyptians believed that unless you did that, you didn't get to go to the afterlife. You had to go through all that ritual and the poor Egyptians couldn't afford it. So they just sort of resigned themselves to the fact that they didn't get an afterlife. Only if you were a pharaoh. And how can a person be a pharaoh and be that dumb? If you can see the jars and the mummy and the sarcophagus in this life, then it didn't go anywhere. The boat is in the ground. 
the mummy is on the ground. It isn't anywhere else, so it didn't go to the afterlife. I mean, that's common sense. And yet they spent billions and b equivalent of billions and billions of dollars doing all that. Not just in Egypt. That was what China did too. When you're a kid, the first emperor of China, okay, of the Jin Dynasty, well, Chen, they, they Wei Jiao spelling. They spell with a Q now. He built all those terracotta warriors. Okay? He built all those terracotta warriors starting when he was 13 years old. So they would be done by the time he died. And then he'd be buried there. And somehow that would magically preserve him and them. So how sane was he? Now, I say all this because, you know, all this stuff is so commonly known. And yet nobody's thinking about the implications of it. It's just as insane as saying to yourself, oh, if I get this car, I'll be more important and happy. It was a common thing when I was in high school. All the boys had to get a car in order to get the girl. Why should a girl like a guy because he's got a car? What makes him better than another guy? Simply because he's got a car? It's a car. It's not him. It's a car. It might be a thing he owns, but why should what he owns make him better than somebody who doesn't own it? If you're a better person, then you're the better person. Whether you own some or not. If you do, fine. If you don't, fine. But a thing you own is a thing you own. It's not you. Well, so that same thinking doesn't enter into the minds of the guys. So they got to have cars. And I mean, in the neighborhood I grew up in, boy, when you were 16, you better get a car. And if you didn't, you were like a lesser person and people laughed at you on campus. Why? See, the insanity starts real early, and it lasts until you're dead. And we're going to sit here and take seriously the arguments of insane people? So when you walk out your door, I'm sorry I, I'm sort of haranguing on this, but it surprises me too. When you walk out your door, everybody that you're walking around, every, when you, if you work in a 20-story building, like I used to do. And you get in that elevator, and it's crowded with like, I don't know, 20 other people. And everybody's looking at the numbers or looking up because they're not going to look at each other because it's so crowded, which is a silly behavior. Pretending, pretending, picking a lie, pretending like the elevator isn't full of people, so we'll look away and we'll look at, we won't, we won't look at each other. That's admitting the truth that we're all crowded together. We don't want to admit the truth. Yeah, our whole lives we don't want to admit the truth. You get in that elevator with all those people not wanting to admit the truth, and then you mimic their behavior too because it's all herd bound. And you realize right away, wait a minute. We are, we are living the movie of invasion of the body snatchers. We're all CPOP people. Or we're insane, take your pick. That's what the integration process with the world produces. Insanity, incompetence. I've sort of said this before, but now I'm focusing on the integration of it. And insanity and it an incompetence, a preference for the lie, and this preference is so great that even once people are dead and in hell, they do not want to change their mind. Because they can, 
Christ died for everybody. First John 2, 2. So why don't they change their mind? A lot of people have asked me that question. Well, if hell lasts forever, how come people don't change their mind? And I want to slap them in the face and say, how can you be so dumb? Why aren't you changing your mind? We're willfully, willfully insane, willfully incompetent, willfully rejecting the truth. Just like when you stand in an elevator with a bunch of people, they willfully look up to avoid looking at each other. Because, oh, then you have to confront the truth that we're all crowded together. We don't want to do that. Oh, not confront the truth. All of our behaviors, all of our cultures, all of our rituals are designed to mask the truth. And we call it politeness. How about calling it what it is? Lying. Bluntness is, is oh no, you're not being polite if you're blunt. Yeah, you're, you're not being polite if you tell the truth. You're only polite if you lie. Wow! It's not Christian love if you bluntly confront some ding-dong who thinks that, oh, you know, Christ died on Friday and rose on Sunday, but that's somehow three days. And you say, how low can you count? Oh, no, you're not being Christian. Uh, hello, but it's okay to lie against the scripture. It's okay to be nasty to the Bible, but it's not okay to be nasty to someone who's being nasty to the Bible. Excuse me. And for 2,000 years, that's exactly what we've practiced. That hypocrisy. Now, I'm not saying you go on a crusade because you can't. But I'm also saying you don't walk away from the truth. But we do. We go out of our way to walk away from it. Oh, it's a difference of interpretation. No, it's not. It's incompetence. Call it what it is. And walk away from those who insist on it. At least in your mind. I'm not saying that you have to, like, cut all of your friendships. But why would you want to be friends with somebody who's so damn dumb they can't count to three? Now, you might have to. And you can't go around positing all of your relationships based upon whether they know God, God or not. You can't do that because 99% of the time they don't and they won't and it isn't going to get any better and you just, you know, you got to live around here and they got to live around here and God's really keeping them around for you. But that does mean that you can start to learn to say, you know what? I think I'll keep my faith in God and the Bible and everybody else has got to pay cash up front. And then you start looking for how do you minimize your contacts? Because it ain't going to get better. Bad friends corrupt good morals. Paul says that somewhere I think in Corinthians or Thessalonians. John in 2 John says, don't, so don't even give him a greeting. Second John 9, I think it is. Now, you can't always just do that. But the more often you can do that, the happier you're going to be. Because why do you want to be around crazy people? The trouble is, the world is full of crazy people. And I'm not too sure about me and thee either. So it's kind of like, use 1 John 1, 9, like breathing. Keep asking God, God, am I screwing up and being crazy like the rest of them here? I'm reading your word. Am I reading it right? Who's my right teacher? Just stand to your right teacher. And live as quiet a life as you can. If you're stuck being a loud mouth, then you got to be a loud mouth, but Figure out how to distance yourself. In your mind, anyway, if you can't do it in your body. Because, honey, the world's nuts. And that's the reality of integration. The world is crazy, and you're not too far different. And the only rope to sanity you got 
is learning and living on Bible using 1 John 1 9 and staying under your teacher. And the more you use that rope, the more that rope will thicken and strengthen and keep you independent and keep you afloat whether they're drowning or not. And they'll try to try drag you down with them. And then when they drown and you're still breathing. Or maybe you're lucky and you get to drown first so you don't have to be around them anymore and go home. But sooner or later you're going to wake up to the fact that this is how it is. Integrate with God or die. And nobody's doing that. So they're all dying even while they walk. You want to talk about a zombie movie? Walk outside your door and you're seeing it. 